This is Ling270, Language, Technology, and Society. In this recording, we will examine various elements of language. We do so to prepare ourselves to examine how writing represents language. We will consider the following elements of language. Phonemes, including consonants and vowels. Syllables, including groups of syllables called feet. Morphemes, that are the minimal units of meaning in a language. Words, collections of words called phrases. And abstract semantic features. The context behind this examination is that we ultimately will examine which of these elements could potentially and practically be used in a writing system. It will turn out that some of these are practical to use, while others will not be practical. Let's begin our review. You should have already been exposed to all of these concepts in at least a small amount of detail in Ling 100. We begin with the smallest unit, a unit of sound. This unit of sound is called a phoneme. A phoneme is a small unit of sound in a language. Let's examine some examples of phonemes in English. By convention, phonemes are written inside slashes, as you see here. In the word cash, the first phoneme in the word is k, k represented here inside slashes with the symbol K. This is not the English letter K, but rather the symbol K in the International Phonetic Alphabet, representing the phoneme K. The second phoneme in the English word cash is A, A represented by the symbol you see here inside slashes. This is an AE combined symbol that we don't have in the English alphabet, but it is in the International Phonetic Alphabet, representing the sound A. Ah. The third phoneme in the English word cash is sh, sh represented in the International Phonetic Alphabet by the symbol you see here between the slashes. That symbol in the International Phonetic Alphabet represents this, the phoneme sh, which in English orthography is represented here as the digraph sh. When we think about the phonemes in English or in any other language, those phonemes can generally be divided into two classes, that is, consonants and vowels. There are more detailed ways of breaking up the distinctions, but those are not relevant for our purposes here. If you take further classes in linguistics, you may well examine those in much more detail. Here are a few of the consonants and vowels in English. P, p, t, t, k, k, s, s. Sh, 
The next level of abstraction in linguistic elements that we will consider is the syllable. A syllable is a vowel possibly surrounded by consonants. Here I'm using a notation called regular expressions, which you may be familiar with if you've taken computer science classes in the past. Here, I'm using the letter C to represent any consonant. I'm using the letter V to represent any vowel. And the asterisk represents the clean star, meaning zero or more occurrences of whatever immediately precedes the star. So C star means zero or more consonants. So, we're going to generally define a syllable as zero or more consonants followed by a vowel followed by zero or more consonants. Now, the actual legal shape of a syllable will vary from language to language. In some languages, the syllable structure may be restricted to, for example, CV, that is, a single consonant followed by a single vowel. Other languages may allow much more complicated combinations of consonants, such as three or four consonants followed by a vowel followed by two or more consonants. After grouping phones into syllables, we can potentially then group syllables into feet. A foot is a grouping of a stressed syllable and an unstressed syllable or syllables. Each language will define a foot in its own way. Either we may have the stressed syllable at the beginning of the foot or the stressed syllable at the end of the foot, and that will vary from language to language. In the example shown in the book, we're using English, where we have the foot with the stressed syllable at the beginning of the foot. Here's an example of a sentence in English where we're going to break up the syllables into feet. So, by convention, we're using parentheses to mark the beginning and end of each syllable. We have the following sentence written in IPA using the International Phonetic Alphabet. Here our example sentence is, doctors use penicillin. This is an example taken from Wikipedia. Doctors use penicillin. So notice that I'm stressing the first syllable in doctors, the second syllable in penicillin, and stressing but lightly stressing the first syllable in penicillin. So. Our first foot is made up of doctors, the syllable doc and the syllable ters. So the stressed syllable doc followed by the unstressed syllable ters. Doctors. The second foot is comprised simply of a single syllable, use. The third foot 
is the first two syllables in the word penicillin. The lightly stressed first syllable, p, and the second unstressed syllable, n. Penne. And the final foot in this sentence is the last two syllables in penicillin. Cillin. So we see here that the square brackets are used by convention to mark the beginning and end of each foot. In this sentence, we have five feet. Doctors use penicillin. The next element of language that we will consider is the morpheme. A morpheme is a minimal unit of meaning in a language. Some examples of morphemes might be, in English, the, dog, er, s, hit, and so on. Some of those were standalone words comprising only a single morpheme. Others are suffixes like er at the end of batter or the s at the end of walks. Here's an example. We have the word argumentative. Argumentative is an English word made up of three morphemes. The first morpheme is argue. The second morpheme is a suffix that attaches to argue, the suffix ment. When argue and ment are combined, they form argument. The third morpheme is a tiv. This combines with the first two morphemes to result in argumentative. Next, we consider the word. A word is a meaningful collection of one or more morphemes that can be uttered or pronounced in isolation. Now, consider the ative morpheme in argumentative. That can't stand alone by itself, so it's not a word. On the other hand, argue could stand alone. So argue by itself is a morpheme and also a word. But meant and ative are morphemes that cannot stand alone as words because you can't say them in isolation in English. You can't say just meant, or you can't just say ative. You also can't say mentative, but you could say argue, you could say argument, and you could say argumentative. So those are all three words because you can pronounce them in isolation. You can pronounce argue in isolation, you could pronounce argument in isolation, and you could pronounce argumentative in isolation. The next item that we look at is the phrase. When we get to phrases, we are now entering the realm of syntax. A phrase is a meaningful collection of one or more words that together represent a syntactic constituent. Finally, the last element that we look at is the semantic feature. Semantic features may be somewhat more abstract than some of the other concepts that we've examined. A semantic feature is an abstract conceptual component of meaning. 
We'll look at some concrete examples of semantic features later on. Now, let's put all of what we've just learned together. We're taking a running example, the English sentence, my dog likes avocados. This example is taken from the textbook, Language, Technology, and Society, and is found in chapter three of that text. To begin with, we're going to look at the phonemes that make up the sentence, my dog likes avocados. Now, one technical point that I want to make here is that the representation that you see here in the International Phonetic Alphabet corresponds with the pronunciation of this sentence as uttered by the textbook author. Now, Richard Sprout and I have different accents. We pronounce this sentence slightly differently. So keep in mind that when I say this sentence, the IPA transcription that would correspond with my pronunciation is slightly different than what you see here. So for example, the vowel that I use when I pronounce dog is different than the vowel you see here. And a couple of the vowels when I pronounce avocados are slightly different than the vowels you see here. Nevertheless, everything that we're going to still talk about still applies. So let's go through the phonemes in my dog likes avocados. First, we have the word my, which is represented by the phonemes you see here. Next, we have the we have the word dog, which is represented by the IPA pronunciation that you see here. Next, we have likes, made up of these individual phonemes. And finally, avocados. Now, let's go through those one at a time, those phonemes one at a time. The first phoneme in my is m. M is a consonant. Now contrast that with the second phoneme in my, which is a diphthong, i, i. That is a vowel in English. Next, we have the first phoneme in dog, d, d. D is a voiced consonant. Next, we have the vowel in dog, which is a vowel. Now, note this vowel that I pronounce, aw, ah, is not the one shown here, but rather the one in Richard's pronunciation. I encourage you to search for an International Phonetic Alphabet clickable chart online right now and see what this vowel sounds like on that chart and compare it with your pronunciation of the word dog. Next, we have the final, the final phoneme in dog is a consonant g, g. In the word likes, we have a word initial consonant, l, followed by the vowel that is the diphthong i, followed by the consonant k, followed by the consonant s. Now note here that in the orthographic representation that you see at the top, that is the English spelling, we have L-I-K-E-S. Now, the E in this word is silent, which means that in the phonetic representation, there is not a phoneme that corresponds with E that we see here. Next, we have the word avocados. Now, the symbol shown here is A, 
which is different than the vowel that I use, ah, in pronouncing avocados. But in either case, it's a vowel. Next, we have v, v, which is a consonant. And next, we have the schwa vowel, uh. The consonant k. The vowel a. Uh, the consonant d. The vowel o. And the consonant z. Now, note here that the representation in the orthography does not always have an obvious match to what we see here in the pronunciation. So in English, the word likes ends in an S. The word avocados also ends in an S. But the S in the word likes is pronounced S, while the S at the end of avocados is pronounced Z. Now that we've gone through the phonemes in the sentence, my dog likes avocados, we will now go through the syllables. So a syllable, as we discussed before, is a vowel with potentially zero or more consonants before it and zero or more consonants after it. So here we see the syllables in the sentence my dog likes avocados. By convention, we're using parentheses to mark the beginning and end of each syllable. The first word in this sentence is my. My has only one syllable. The next word is dog. Dog also has one syllable. My has a consonant followed by a vowel, and that forms a syllable. Dog is a consonant, a vowel, and a consonant forming a syllable. So remember that we could represent consonants as C and vowels as V in shorthand. So if we want to describe vowels, excuse me, syllable structure, we could say that the first syllable has the form CV because there's a consonant followed by a vowel. The second syllable has the form CVC because we have a consonant followed by a vowel followed by a consonant. The next word, likes, also has one syllable, but the shape of that syllable is a little more interesting. We have a consonant followed by a vowel, followed by two consonants. So the shape of this syllable, likes, would be C, V, C, C, because we have a consonant, a vowel, consonant, consonant. Next, we have the word avocados. There are four syllables in the word avocados. The first syllable is very simple in form. It is simply a vowel by itself. Next, we have the, a CV syllable, because we have a consonant followed by a vowel. The third syllable in the word avocados is also of shape CV. K, K. And finally, the fourth and final syllable in the word avocados is dos, dos. This has the syllable shape C, V, C, because we have a consonant followed by a vowel followed by a consonant. Now, given that we have broken up our syllables in the word, excuse me, in the sentence, we can now group those syllables into feet. The first foot is my dog. 
So my, in the pronunciation that I'm using in this sentence, is stressed. Dog is unstressed. My dog forms a foot. Likes forms a foot. Now recall, we're using square brackets to denote the beginning and end of each foot. And finally, the word avocados, which has four syllables broken into two feet. Avocados. Next, let's look at the morphemes in the sentence, my dog likes avocados. First, we have the morpheme my. That is a, a word comprised of only one morpheme. That's relatively common in English. Next, we have the morpheme dog, also made up of one morpheme. Now note, if we had the word dogs, plural, that would be made of two morphemes, the morpheme dog and then the morpheme s. The third word, likes, indeed, has two morphemes, like and s. The final word in the sentence, avocados, is comprised also of two morphemes, avocado and s, the plural morpheme, which here surfaces as a z. Next, we have the words themselves, which we've been talking about all along. So, my dog likes avocados. So we see here that this sentence has four words. Next, we can look at the phrases. So phrases are combinations of words that comprise a syntactic constituent. So, in this sentence, we have a noun phrase, my dog. Now, some analyses would call this a determiner phrase, but in either case, it's a syntactic constituent. The second phrase is a verb phrase, likes avocados. And finally, the noun phrase and the verb phrase combine together to form a constituent called a sentence. So the entire sentence is, my dog likes avocados. Finally, let's examine semantic features of one of the constituents in this sentence. Now, semantic features are a bit harder to pin down than some of the other things that we've been talking about. There are different ways of uh, breaking up the semantic space. Here I'm showing one possible way, but there are very many. So when we look at the constituent, my dog, one thing that we could notice is that my dog represents something that in the real world is animate. So it's animate versus inanimate. A stone would be inanimate. A bird or a dog is animate. A dog is also a mammal, as opposed to a bird or a fish. A dog is a canine, as opposed to a feline. And a dog, most of the time, is four-legged. Now, there are potentially many, many more semantic features that could apply to the concept my dog. One of those is that it's possessed. It's not just any dog, it's my dog. Someone owns the dog. And who owns the dog? Well, me. So that is a first-person singular possessor. So, I am the first person, and it's just me. It's not we, it's me. So, we have now done a brief review of the elements of language that you would have first been exposed to 
in Ling 100. We examine the concept of a phoneme, that is, a unit of sound in a language. We examine the syllable, which is a vowel possibly surrounded by consonants, the specific shape of which will be defined by the particular language. Syllables can be grouped together into feet. A foot is a grouping of a stressed syllable and one or more, zero or more, excuse me, unstressed syllables. A morpheme is a minimal unit of meaning in a language. A word is a meaningful collection of one or more morphemes that can be uttered in isolation. A phrase is a meaningful collection of one or more words that represents a syntactic constituent. And finally, a semantic feature is an abstract conceptual component of meaning. Take some time now and think through these elements of language. Think about how and which of these elements would be practical when it comes to creating a writing system. Think about how many there are in a language. How many phonemes are there in English? Compare that with how many syllables there are in English, or how many morphemes there are in English, or how many words, or how many phrases.